Hello and welcome to the Michael Collins House podcast. And this time we have a very special episode as we have approached the centenary of the beginning of the Anglo-Irish Treaty negotiations. Now for our, I suppose this is our first delve into um, a live interview type uh, podcast. Um, and I suppose we couldn't have somebody better for our first um, endeavour in this. And so on our on this episode, we have one of the foremost Collins scholars, a man who has authored a large number of publications on the man himself with books such as Michael Collins, The Man Who Won the War, The Squad, Michael Collins and The Civil War. And of course, much of the content of this uh, podcast will be coming from the books. I signed my own death word and big fellow Longfellow. Uh, a joint Michael Collins and Eamon de Valera biography. So welcome, Royal Dwyer. Thank you. Um, so before we start, Royal, um, could you just, I suppose, give us a little bit of background about yourself? I suppose everybody is aware of your, your books. Everybody, I'm sure plenty of people who visit our museum have read your books, but I suppose little, little wouldn't know too much about yourself. Um, so tell me what got you interested in Collins in the first place? Well, I got interested when I was at university in the United States. I had, uh, I'd been raised in Ireland from the age of four and gone all the way through school. And I don't, I found that the history system was, seemed to be crazy when I was in school. We, we, the leaving certificate that year in uh, 19, in the 1960s was, uh, St. Patrick, and to me, this was mythology rather than uh, than history as such. And we we never dealt with anything re remotely touching on the twentieth century. So I didn't actually do history in the leaving cert. I was just turned off by the whole thing. And then when I went to the United States, there was a uh, I went to the United States because my father was killed while serving in the U.S. Army in World War II. Right. And I had a grant to go to university, okay. which they wouldn't give me in Ireland, but they would give it to me in the States. And I, it was just that I, one of the requirements in, in Texas at the time was that you had to have two courses of modern history and the United States history. And I found that fascinating that this was 20th century and we went back in the four talkies and, you know, with St. Patrick. And I, I just got interested and I wrote, we had to write a term paper and I wrote a term paper on the Irish Civil War. And I really knew nothing about it. Okay. I hadn't I hadn't heard anything about it in school, and I just found the the whole role of Collins and the and the thing was fascinating. Great, great. Well, I suppose you've you've kind of um, overdone it on the research now at this point with all the books you have. I well, know. I I went on to I did I became so interested I did a masters and I right. wrote my master's thesis on the treaty and why they signed, and I wrote then I went on and did a doctorate and I did my doctorate on Irish neutrality during World War Two, and right. I, I wrote my dissertation on U.S. relations with Ireland. Uh, so, so that's where the, the interest in De Valera comes from then and that part. Yeah, and I couldn't, I suppose I couldn't have been more favourable to De Valera relative to neutrality. Mm. And I couldn't be more critical of De Valera relative to the treaty. Right. You know, the, the, I just felt that he was a disaster in one and he was magnificent in the other. Well, sure, we'll, we'll talk about the, what you call the disaster now anyway, so... A nice little segue through for us there, right? And um, so, right, I suppose this kind of period of the De Valera Collins story, this time 100 years ago, is probably one of the more controversial parts of modern Irish history and of the Michael Collins story. And um, I think, I suppose, 
from us and kind of interacting with visitors in the museum here, I think the context of what was happening around this time in Irish politics has been kind of a little bit lost to pop culture and I suppose the Michael Collins movie and other things. Um, and this kind of, I suppose, negative demonization of De Valera kind of seems to stem from this exact moment of De Valera not going to negotiations and sending Collins and Griffith over instead. Um, but I suppose with this podcast, what I really would like to do is to kind of look at the history behind the decision and the lead up to this point. And um, so really what I want to look at is, kind of, I suppose, go back uh, to Collins and De Valera in the initial stages of the, the, the post-1916 era. So I suppose, could you tell us a little bit about, I suppose, how their relationship developed in the early years and um, just after kind of 1916 and the, the beginning of 1919? Well, I would think that you know, in 1916, they didn't know each other, really. Collins yeah. was, was the small boy, so to speak. And De Valero was one of the recognized leaders. But uh, in where it, 1919, when the War of Independence broke out, that's where Collins came into his own. And Collins, Collins really was one of the instigators of the war. He wanted a war with the British and he, because he believed that uh, the Republicans would gain most of it. And he also wanted... De Valera to lead this war, and he was he was already building his intelligence system within the Republican movement, and he was involved in organizing De Valera's escape from Lincoln Jail in uh, March, uh, in a in February nineteen nineteen, mm. and I uh, then I. He and he, there was an announcement issued in the press that De Valera was returning to Ireland and that he was going to receive a civic reception. He'd be met by the Lord Mayor of Dublin and brought to the mansion house where he would deliver an address to the Irish people. And I, this basically, the last time this had been done was when Queen Victoria visited Ireland. And the British were horrified that they, this was the kind of treatment that they would normally give to a head of state. And they're here, this escaped convict, so to speak, is getting this kind of reception in Dublin. So the British banned it. And I, the, there was a meeting called, the, the, it said the whole thing about uh, the plans for this reception were published in the paper and it was a, a press release from Sinn Féin, supposedly from Sinn Féin. It was over the names of the two Sinn Féin honorary secretaries, Harry Boland and Tom Kelly. And the, this, they made this supposed announcement. But Sinn, the Sinn Féin executive called an emergency meeting two days later to discuss this thing. And at the very outset, Kelly was asked uh, where he came up with this idea, where what, where did he get the endorsement? And he said that he never even heard of it at a meeting. The first he heard of it was when he read the announcement over his own name in the paper, and he had nothing to do with that. And it was at that point Michael Collins uh, interrupted, according to uh, Daryl Fidges, who was at the meeting. And Daryl Fidges recalled it in his uh, memoir, uh, Recollections of the Irish War. Mm. And uh, Collins basically, uh, uh, how do I put it? He, He, he kind of took responsibility for it anyway. He he was the one. He who took full anything. responsibility for it, and, yeah. and he basically said that the people, uh, Sinn Fein, had nothing to do with it. It was the people that were. I I'd see where I'd I find it here. Uh, well, the Irish Volunteers was it? But, it yeah. 
he accepted full responsibility for the press announcement. He told the meeting that he, with forceful candor, that he held them in no opinion at all. They were only summoned to confirm what the proper people had decided. Fidges continued, he spoke with much vehemence and emphasis, saying that the sooner the fighting was forced and a general state of disorder created through the country, the better it would be for the country. Ireland was likely to get more out of a state of general disorder than from a continuance of the situation as it then stood. The proper people to take decisions of that kind were ready to face the British military and were resolved to force the issue, Collins insisted. They were not to be deterred by weaklings and cowards. This, this was an extraordinary arrogant statement, you know, and it was insensitive and, and it, it yeah. really didn't take to say too much for his opinion of the people he was dealing with. Yeah, he was, I suppose, one of the, the more militant kind of of the leaders there at that time. Well, he was probably the most militant. Mm. And I suppose, how did, how did De Valera take that then? Well, De Valera demanded, De Valera, of course, wasn't at that meeting or anything, but he demanded that the reception be abandoned. Right. Because he believed that innocent people, that there would be trouble and innocent people would be killed. And he thought this was wrong, that they shouldn't do it. So he demanded it be called off. And uh, the British banned it, so it basically was called off. And De Valera then, he also, De Valera had no intention of leading the war that Collins wanted. De Valera wanted to go to the United States. He believed that that's where he could be most effective in gathering support for the Irish Republican movement. Right. And so he heads off to America then to... He headed off to America in, in, at the start of June 1919. And he remained there until uh, 1920, early 1920, 1920, or late, it was late 1921, 20. December 1920, isn't it? Yeah. And um, so I suppose Collins remains then back, back in Ireland and... Yeah, Collins on. remained there. His next move was to get Austin Stack to okay. support and lead the military approach. And he personally visited Stack in Strangeways Prison in Manchester and helped organize his escape. And then when Stack got out, Collins used his influence to have him appointed Deputy Chief of Staff of the IRA as the Irish Volunteers had become known during the War of Independence. Right. And I, Stack had no intention of uh, doing Collins's bidding, and he never even attended a meeting of the headquarters staff. Right. So Collins's plans for De Valera and Stack were equally futile. Right. Um, so Collins, I suppose, continued on with his own plans by himself then after that? Yeah, he continued. And, uh, the oh, hold on there, right? We just... I missed, we lost you there just for a second. If you could just oh, start I, to get I put my hand on the computer, that might be. Yeah. I, Collins, I. We were, we were, Collins we kind of continued on himself then with his own. Oh, yeah, Collins, uh, Collins just went ahead uh, with his own plans and he, he basically I waged a war against the British and I, the, the British retaliated by organizing uh, the auxiliaries and the black and tans to support as an armed militant support for the uh, Royal Irish Constabulary. Now, most of the Royal Irish Constabulary were Irishmen. And mm. the British couldn't depend on them to fight Irishmen. Yeah. So they, they put in the black and tans and the auxiliaries. And they, 
these people worked, they didn't have very good in, intelligence sources and they, they tended to overreact and their reaction to violence was to overreact and they, up, uh, they kind of upset tones and they, 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 I suppose the classic confrontation would have been when in, on Bloody Sunday and that's when Collins had some 15, I think, uh, British agents killed on the morning of Bloody Sunday in Dublin. Bloody Sunday was the third Sunday in November 1920. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, the British, uh, as well, the two auxiliaries were killed when they got in the way. And the British retaliated that afternoon. The auxiliaries raided Crow Park, where there was a football match between Tipperary and Dublin. It was only a challenge match. Uh, but in, eventually, both Tipperary and Dublin actually met in the 1920s All Ireland final, which was played two years later. Yeah. And Tipperary actually won that one. People are kind of trying to forget that Tipperary did win a few All Irelands in football in the early days. Uh, but uh, the tens of the auxiliaries came into the pitch. And they started, they opened fire on the, the crowd. There was this, a crowd of between 10 and 15,000 spectators. They opened fire on the spectators and they actually killed Michael Hogan, one of the Tipperary footballers on the field. And it, now the people killed it, it included a 10 year old and a 14 year old boy mm -hmm. and a young woman who had gone to the match with her fiance, they were due to get married five days later. Yeah. And yeah. she was killed. None of them had any connection with the IRA, but they were basically killed in retaliation for what happened, what the IRA had done on Bloody Sunday morning. Yeah, I, I think, I suppose, Bloody Sunday really, and kind of looking at our, the war timeline and stuff that we've done in our own exhibition, that here is kind of. It was a, a turning point for the, the whole War of Independence, really, and things kind of really escalated from there on as well. You have Kill Michael a couple of months later, you have the, the, the burning of Cork, you know, all these kind of quite large events in the, the following few months as well that really brought things to a head. But I suppose what I want to do is kind of bring it back to the, the Collins de Valera relationship, kind of. So, throughout this period, anyway, there was little or no interaction between the two de Valeras in America. Um, Collins is, I suppose, had was becoming one of the most important leaders for the Republican movement and was, I suppose, seemingly very successful in what he was yeah, trying well, to do at this point as well. And um, so how does De Valera return? How does he come back into the picture? Well, and I suppose, what happened basically was after Bloody Sunday, De Valera had been instrumental in the selection of Arthur Griffith to replace him when he went to the United States, Arthur Griffith took over as acting president. Mm -hmm. And in the wake of Bloody Sunday, Arthur Griffith was arrested by the British. They were just lashing out and they arrested him and he was jailed. And De Valera decided he better get back to Ireland because Collins is going to take over from, De from Griffith and he didn't want Collins taking over. Mm -hmm. So he came back. And, you know, when it, one of his first things upon his return was he spoke to the chief of staff of the IRA, Richard Mulcahy. And he told Mulcahy that the, the war was being fought in the wrong way. And did, I, sorry, right? do you think the, the reason why he didn't want Collins taken over is because Collins was, I suppose, such a militant leader and that he, he wasn't that was the way he thought he should be doing it? Collins was much more militant than De Valera was, and therefore yeah, De Valera yeah. didn't really want him taking over. Okay. And I, I, I see what they, but De Valera, he wanted to, to change the, the, the tact, essentially. Yeah, I, but it's just that De Valera, he said, you're going too fast. This is what he said to Mulcahy. 
this right. odd shooting of a policeman here and there is having a very bad effect from the propaganda point of view on us in America. What we want is one good battle once a month with about 500 men on each side. Now, this was not only insensitive and arrogant, the way he responded, it was also unrealistic because mm. the IRA had neither the trained men nor the proper arms to wage a monthly battle of well, with 500 people on their own side. I, Devil, and then one of Colin, De Valera's next move was to try to send Collins to the United States. But mm. the big fella balked. That long who won't get rid of me as easy as that, he remarked. And, you know, it just shows that there was a kind of spleen between them that had yeah. been developing all along. Right. And I suppose De Valera kind of got his way with the, the one large battle with the Custom House battle as well. We kind of yeah, well, the, custom house, the, the, the way the Custom House turned out, well, eh, Collins would have had his way too, but it was just that uh, I, De Valera had a more realistic approach and he... I, he he realized that in, in the United States, the United States had been allied with Britain in the World War One. Mm. And this was right in the aftermath of World War One. And he believed the Americans would not turn their back on uh, on a recent ally. Yeah. So yeah. that there was no way that they were gonna support Ireland openly. And he therefore advocated that Britain should declare a kind of Monroe Doctrine for the British Isles. And de Valera said that the Irish would guarantee Britain that Irish independence would never be used to undermine British security. That, in other words, the British didn't have to worry about the Republicans at their back door. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he was realistic about that. And in fairness, Collins also saw that the the terror had they had to kind of temper the terror. Uh, he he believed that the way it was going, the British were losing the people. You know, the the Irish people were turning. They they yeah, had yeah. a choice, but they with the British or were with their with their own people. And they were tended to turn, and Collins said that they we are winning. The terror that the British wanted to instill in this country has completely broken down, he argued. It is only a question of time until we shall have them cleared out. Now, that is right. another thing, but that's what he believed. And uh, he he also, he, he learned that... Uh, Carl Boer, the Minister for Defence, had asked Sean McKeown to lead an attack on the British cabinet in London. And Collins thought this was madness. Do you think that England has the makings of only one cabinet? You know, if you, you kill the cabinet members, it was only going to stock up the British government and it, it yeah. was going to be justified in its retaliation. Yeah, yeah. I suppose the way the war had kind of planned out as well, that it, it kind of suited the IRA, that it was kind of, I suppose, a war against the police, the auxiliaries and the Black Pans rather than an all-out military war that they wouldn't have the, the, the forces. It suited them in Ireland, definitely. Yeah, yeah. You know, that these people were... These people were reacting, you know, when they... Like, the reaction to Bloody Sunday. Go and shoot people at a football match who had nothing to do with the IRA. Mm. It, it was crazy and it, it just antagonized people. But uh, then Lloyd George realized, Lloyd George was the British Prime Minister, that uh, it was necessary to, to appear to want peace. Yeah. And he started. Uh, Making taking initiatives in June and July of 1921 
Marte to get talks going. He arranged Jan Christian Smuts for Jan Christian Smuts, the South Prime Africa. Minister of South Africa, to visit De Valera to try and impress on De, De Valera the importance of dominion status within mm. the British Empire. He has done the same, I suppose, in the Boer War, really, coming from a similar situation. Well, it, this is the thing. We, we, uh, De Valera just said to Smuts, we want a free choice, not a choice where the alternative is force. We must not be bullied into a decision. The British will never give you this choice, Smuts replied. You are next door to them. He added that his own colleagues in South Africa had waged a Boer War against Britain. But when they were subsequently asked if they desired a republic, Smuts said that a very large majority preferred free partnership within the British Empire. As a friend, I cannot advise you too strongly against the Republic, Smuts said to De Valera. Ask what you want, but not a Republic. If the status of dominion rule is offered, De Valera replied, I will use all our machinery to get the Irish people to accept it. Mm. This report had a great influence on when uh, Smuts reported this, the, the report had a great influence on Lloyd George to negotiate with De Valera. Right. So, so that I, a big pardon? I suppose that kind of kick-started the, the initial negotiations yeah. then. On the 24th of June, 1921, Lloyd George invited De Valera and any colleagues he might select to a conference in London mm. to explore the, to the utmost the possibility of a settlement. He added that Britain would, of course, give a safe conduct to all those who may be chosen to participate in the conference. Mm. Evelyn responded by insisting that a truce be agreed and implemented first. A truce was duly arranged and came into effect on 11 July 1921. De Valera then met privately with Lloyd George at uh, 10 Downing Street on July, uh, July 14th, yeah. by sparking the negotiations that ultimately led to the Anglo-Irish Treaty in December 1921. And I suppose, how was this then back in Ireland? How was this kind of, these negotiations kind of found? Well, it, they, they had to be organised uh, slowly. Uh, well, you see, Collins, when De Valera was going over to London with the delegation, Collins wanted to be part of that delegation, but De Valera wouldn't have him. And De Valera argued that the war might be renewed with the British and that Collins was too important to be to have been exposed by the negotiations, you know, that the British would recognize him too easily thereafter. So he would he didn't want Collins in London. And Collins was despondent. At this moment, he wrote, after the truce was implemented, there is more ill will within a victorious assembly than ever could be anywhere except in the devil's own assembly. Mm. One of the things I suppose, uh, right, the, in our own research here, and when we were looking at it, it was like, would I suppose one of the decisions for not sending Collins over, like, I suppose you can kind of, from that you see that De Valera is kind of massaging Collins' ego a small bit and saying, you know, that they, they need him in case the military struggle is renewed and that, but like, with Collins realistically going over for negotiations with the reputation that he held at the time as kind of this, the leader of a murder gang and this kind of thing, I suppose, it would have made kind of negotiating with him a little bit more difficult from the British point of view as well. Oh yeah, I'm sure that, that that's what De Valera also saw that they, you know, he was, it, that without Collins, he was likely to get more than he'd get with Collins as part of a delegation. 
So I, I can understand why he did, but they, he probably was a bit insensitive in the way he handled it. He could have been, he could have massaged Collins a little bit better and just explained that. Yeah. And yeah. Collins, Collins was an intelligent man. Collins would have understood. So what was the outcome of the July negotiations then with De Valera? Well, Lloyd George, I it, it said there was uh, he found it extraordinary that De Valera was more inclined to listen than he had expected. And he added pointedly, he listened well. Right. You know, and that's frequently De Valera is depicted as somebody who only heard what he wanted to hear himself. But that, that this wasn't the way it was, what the way Lloyd George found him, certainly. And I, Lloyd George offered a kind of dominion status to the 26 counties that was limited by a defense demands curtailing the size of the Irish army, prohibiting an Irish navy, and giving Britain the rights to whatever Irish military or naval facilities she might desire in time of war or strained relations. That uh, this was the requirement. And on discussing these terms, uh, De Valera indicated that he would accept real dominion status. And this was the actual dominion status, not a, a kind of bastardized version of it. The British dominions have been conceded to them all the rights that Irish Republicans demand, he told the Manchester Guardian in February 1921. It is obvious that these rights were not being denied to us. We would not be engaged in the present struggle. So De Valera was indicating he would accept real dominion status. From the yeah. outset, uh, and what do you think that was? That was De Valera's plan then to, to to go with the Dominion status, or? Well, the the problem is that he he was kind of talking out of both sides of his mouth. He was also talking about he wanted external association, and by that he meant that Ireland would not actually be a Dominion; it would be associated with the dominions and all matters in which they were associated, but it would not be an actual dominion and it would not be giving allegiance to the British crown. And he, he, this is where he was making the distinction and this is where the problems were created later. Okay. I, I, I do not say that the answer was for a form of government so much, because we are not Republican doctrineers, De Valera said, but it is for Irish freedom and Irish independence. And it was obvious to everyone who considered the question that Irish independence could not be realized by any other way so suitably as through the Republic. Yet he had indicated to both Smuts and Lord George that unfettered, the unfettered status of the Dominions would be acceptable. Right. So um, I suppose back in, in the doll, then, like, how, how was this received? Well, you know, the way De Valera put it himself, I'd be willing to suggest to the Irish people to give up a good deal in order to have an Ireland that could look to the future without anticipating distracting internal problems. In other words, the, the North was going to be a, an internal problem that was distracting. Let's placate the North by agreeing to Dominion status and that's what he was basically saying. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose they were Britain, one of the kind of biggest issues, or they were kind of looking for kind of security, or, uh, you know, in terms of the size of the army. Yeah, well, you know, De, Valera, 
De Valera also believed that uh, it was necessary to satisfy Britain's security requirements. Mm -hmm. I, because if they weren't, he warned, the British would depict the Irish as unreasonable. America and the international community generally would agree. England would then be given a free hand to deal with Ireland. So that's why De Valera, you know, De Valera was prepared to compromise and was open about it. Okay, so I suppose really what what came out of these negotiations at the end of it then, um, no decisions really made, but, but what, what was the plan for well, De Valera that really came forward? Out, what really came out of it was that the Lloyd, uh, Lloyd George suggested that there be a conference in London and that they negotiate it. Basically, that they negotiate a settlement. Right. Uh, well, De Valera was determined to stay in the background. If he were, he said, if he were not the president, and as, and thus a symbol of the Irish Republic, he would go to these negotiations. But he was, so he, he he was had to stay in the background. He proposed instead that Arthur Griffith should lead the delegation and that it should include Collins, who was very right. reluctant to go. So I, I suppose this kind of brings us up to kind of that, that controversial decision, really, where De Valera decides that he's not going to partake in the, the second round of the negotiations. Um, but first, really, I he, suppose... He forces Collins to go in and, and partake. And Collins yeah. made it clear it was De Valera and others that forced him to do it. it was against his own better judgment. So I, I suppose that's kind of the interesting part of this as well. Collins was so eager to go the first time around and kind of was was refused that. Um, the second time around, he's also very reluctant to go over. So I suppose what is it about this second round of negotiations that neither men wanted to go this time around? De Valera gives his reasons for saying. So I suppose what was the official reasoning for De Valera not going? And well, it, was... this is this is the thing that the, in Collins's mind, I think he was suspicious of De Valera. It was a, a personal suspicion, and that. Uh, as what Colin said, I had no choice. I had to go because of the influence that De Valera and others were using in him. And yeah. But De Valera had no intention of going. And he then he he insisted that the the de, de, five man delegation would be given plenty potentiary powers. Now one of the five, George Gavin Duffy, objected to the. They were being given too much influence, and he didn't think this was right. And De Valera, sorry, sorry there, um, Ryan. Just for just to bring it back there a second, I know you were you were kind of you saying De Valera, He gave kind of the the official kind of view that you know if he were not the president or a symbol of the uh, the republic, he he would go, but he wanted to kind of keep back to to kind of as that symbol. Um, for the Republic, but like, and I suppose that's the official reason given, and I know there was probably other reasons given kind of later on in life, Devil Air game. but from your own perspective, your own point of view, I suppose, your your own reasons, why why do you think he didn't, didn't go? Well, I think he recognised that it was going to be very difficult to get a settlement, and he'd be better off if he stayed in the background supporting the people looking for the thing and if he got the agreement that he wanted then he could support it fully and this is one of the things he even though they were given plenty of potential powers they were given secret instructions that they would before signing anything they would send it to dublin and await a reply before signing and this was like in other words they couldn't sign a treaty without waiting for the reply and i think de valera thought that he could block any kind of agreement that he didn't agree with that way yeah, but yeah. that wasn't the way but, it turned out but but de valera he was kind of the one that pushed for the plenipotentiary powers in the doll as well oh well, yeah he did he threatened twice he would resign as president if the uh plenty if the delegates weren't given plenty potential powers 
and they, even with some of them objecting, they were, was able to override those objections, and they were given plenty potential powers. Right. Um, so the, the, I suppose the green light was given then for, for the, the, the negotiations to go ahead. Um, yeah. With Collins and Arthur Griffith heading up the, the negotiating party um, along with the, the other three plenipotentiaries and a, a, I suppose a, a wider kind of group of people going over in support as well, secretaries and that kind of thing as well. Yeah, well, they had a delegation with, uh, made up, you know, the, of support of uh, people to facilitate them. So, so basically, they're they're sent over. Um, a reluctant Collins kind of at the head of it, um, with the powers to carry out the negotiations. But well, Griffith was really at the head of it, but yeah, Collins was yeah, the backup, yeah. and Collins was the real influence. Collins, yeah, Griffith didn't have all that much influence with the the hardline Republicans. He did have it within the nationalist movement as a whole. Collins was seen as the one with the real influence within the nationalist movement. Oh, sure, sure, sorry. Well, Griffith, Griffith is officially chairman of the of the negotiating party. Collins is kind of Collins second room a, there as well. Nice so chairman. Essentially, they're sent over with the the, the plenipotentiary powers, but with the the, the kind of with the, the, the proviso that they must await a reply oh, before signing. So they head off on the, the 11th of October, 1921, and to take part in the note, to, I suppose. To begin That's when the conference started in London, the 11th yeah, of yeah. October. Perfect. So look, Royal, do you know what? I'm going to leave it there at the start of the negotiations. Um, and I suppose we'll pick up uh, for the second part of this podcast series um, and we look at the actual negotiations themselves and kind of how they develop and eventually end it. Um, so for now, I suppose, um, I just want to thank you for giving your time um, and I look forward to next time chatting with you. Um, so there we have it, really. That's the, the kind of the history of the, the controversy that I suppose it, it really impacted on the, the subsequent months and years of the Anglo-Irish Treaty and eventually, I suppose, the Civil War, really. And I suppose you could go further to say that it's kind of one of those moments in Irish history that kind of had a domino effect and influenced Irish politics for nearly the last hundred years, really. And so for all our listeners, first off, I just I, again, I'd like to thank Royal for joining us. And um, it's great to have such a, an end, um, I suppose, person here to, to discuss this with us. And um, thanks very much, Royal. Thanks for joining us today. And thanks to all our listeners for listening to the podcast. Um, hopefully you will join us again on the next podcast and, and follow up on the next one which will also be with Royal Royal.